Um, we're going to be, uh, I'm going to ask the other speakers to join me up on stage, and we're going to have a brief discussion. Can you, I think you take that back. Um, so, car yes, you can carry on your conversation um, up here. Um, and actually, I'm going to take center so I can hopefully swivel around and see everybody. And while our panelists are coming up to the stage, um, I'm just going to take care of a little bit of sort of business and explanation, just wherever you would like. There is no, uh, there's no order here. Um, hopefully, as we begin, there is an order. But we will need to end pretty sharply at 2.45 because of an event that's taking place here. So, um, but we're, you're welcome to continue this conversation um, as we take the reception upstairs to um, the shop. Um, as I was sitting listening to all of these papers, um, it's always funny when you bring together a group of speakers because you, um, you have an idea of how things are going to go, but there are always kind of themes that emerge on their own. People end up somehow with similar things on their minds. And um, one thing that emerged to me is um, <clears throat> in, a uh, in as much as the exhibition presents these wonderful works, and um, you've heard all kinds of uh, scholarship and discussions about them, um, including even a bit of new scholarship in Um There's been, uh, I think you may have heard a, a sort of undercurrent or a subtext of questions about dates, questions about titles, not knowing perhaps where, uh, why Arp did certain things at certain times when he actually began making sculpture, for example. Um, uh, that there are you know, posthumous casts as well. And if you look at the catalog, um, you go to the back, which is usually where all the boring stuff is. Um, the list of works is prefaced by an introduction, which is kind of unusual in an exhibition catalog. But it was the result uh, on my part of basically despair which I wrote this introduction before I actually wrote the, uh, the, the essay for the catalog. And um, it came out of just a kind of enormous frustration uh, and feeling like I hit a wall as a scholar with how much is unknown uh, still about Arp's work uh, and what he thought about his work and when he actually did certain things. Some of this is a result of just um, there needing to be more research in certain areas. Uh, but some of it, I think, is also really the result of kind of the nature of Arp, the way he conducted himself as an artist, and some of these really deeply subversive and radical um, approaches that he took to writing and to making uh, art, whether it was drawings, prints, reliefs, uh, or sculpture. And I'll start with an example that Valberga and I talked about at lunch. Um, she mentioned uh, in her talk uh, Arp beginning to make sculpture in 1933, uh, based on a comment in a letter uh, that uh, Sophie Teuber Arp had written about uh, Arp beginning to make plaster sculptures. If you look at the show upstairs and you read most accounts, 1930 is the date given to Arp beginning to work in plaster. Um, that's a date that I've maintained, partly because um, I didn't feel like an exhibition was the place to try to question the whole apparatus of dates. Uh, that I, don't, I didn't feel like I could reassign dates to works that were borrowing from other people. Um, that's something I thought would be a discussion to come uh, hopefully out of this exhibition. But I also felt like it's, um, it's a very interesting problem because just taking sculpture as an example, art published images. Uh, in a Belgian magazine in 1929 of, of plaster or perhaps a plaster cast of a clay sculpture that he had made. It's not a very, to my mind, a very good sculpture. It's not very interesting. It's not anything at all like what followed. Um, and Valberga is absolutely correct that in 1933, 
this is when he exhibits his sculpture in the round for the first time. It's the first time it's reproduced in magazines. That's when Barbara Hepworth visits his studio and sees all of these plasters. Um, my hunch from having looked at many of these works is that um, Art may have been working all that time trying to figure out how to make plaster sculpture that really satisfied him. Um, one of the wonderful things about the chronology of these sculptures in 1930, he's shown as making three works. Um, his catalogue raisonné defines it being three disagreeable objects on a face, the work on the catalogue's cover, um, Caspar, the bust that we've seen several times in this presentation, also on view upstairs, and a little torso, which is on view right outside uh, the foyer gallery by the elevator. These are all remarkably accomplished works. Um, and nicely enough, they basically established the three directions that Arp's sculpture would subsequently take sort of standing figures, sort of bust or head-like forms, and these more kind of amorphous natural forms. Um, my own take is that the multi-parts perhaps came first. They would have been the simplest things to form and to shape, and these others developed from there. This is supposed to be a discussion, so I want to sort of open it up, but I'm just presenting that as an example of the kind of work that still needs to be done um, on ARP's work. And it comes in many areas. It comes in the area of collaborations, which works are really collaborations um, between ARP and Teuber ARP uh, titles, which may have been given afterwards. And so having already talked a lot, I feel like, um, I'd like to ask our panelists how they have dealt with these kinds of questions of being unsure about dates or titles, um, Arp's intentions with his sculptures, for example, what Arp may have intended in exhibit with his, the display of his work. Um, and do you feel that this is something that is it's just sort of typical when you have an historical artist, or does Arp seem like another case altogether? If anybody, I can, I can pick you or you can volunteer your opinion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> The question of date was for Arp um, even before a question. For example, when he uh, made with um, El Lisitsky the, magazine, uh, the, the book right. uh, Kunst Isman, there is a discussion he is writing about that to his sister-in-law that um, El Lisitsky dated in the book all works except his ones and the ones of Sophie Teuber Arp. Mm -hmm. And he is very angry about that because he wrote to his sister-in-law, I am the first abstract artist and, mm -hmm. artist. and if there is no date in that book for my work, mm -hmm. nobody will mention that I'm the first one. So mm -hmm. it was a, like a battle between El Lisitsky and they even mm -hmm. wanted to go to a, he wanted to go to a lawyer mm -hmm. to get the date beside mm -hmm. his work. Mm -hmm. And so there was quite an importance, you see, for him to say, well, definitely in 16 I was working abstract mm -hmm. like that. And I think for the sculptures, Sophie Teuber is writing in January uh, 33 that Arp met a guy who told him how to treat plaster and now he is working, making little sculptures and sculptures and sculptures and that he is very happy about that. And in Kayeda, it's uh, the head with the annoying objects mm -hmm. is mm -hmm. just, I think it's spring of 33, mm -hmm. published and just, it's like, Propaganda, like Lewis said, it's up. It said it's the new art up is doing now. Mm -hmm. So I think um, it was important for him that maybe he did some first tries in plaster, like you said before, but he wasn't content. So, mm -hmm. but how has how has it impacted, say, the work that you're doing on Sophie Teuber Arps? Um, the exhibition because so much of the dating of her work came after her death and ARP was very much involved with that. Yes, we tried, when we started with the exhibition, I was looking at catalogues of exhibitions during her lifetime, looking for titles for dates and I tried to identify the works which have been shown at that time so that I could give a correct date and a mm -hmm. correct uh, title. 
But it's a similar problem because she died and she mostly didn't title. And when Ab made the catalog resonate for her, he was given the titles and sometimes he often he dated the works, which is not always correct. Not all the works are that early. And I think that's, uh, it's okay. The works are not, not uh, worse because they are maybe from the 20s or exactly. From the 30s. Exactly. That's not the question. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the, Eric? The, well, there is also, of course, the, the issue that Tessa raised this morning, which is that clearly ARP enjoyed a certain amount of poetic license with dates, including his own date of birth, which of yeah. course in every single publication <laughs> for many, many years, you know, was incorrectly reproduced. You know, it was, it's only relatively right. recently that people have actually been, been acknowledging his real birth date. Mm -hmm. And certainly in terms of his poetry and the publication of his poetry, he, uh, my sense is that he was very knowingly being quite creative with dating and, 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 and uh, acknowledging the, the provenance. I, I wonder if he in actually quite enjoyed throwing a few spanners in the works for the, the, mm -hmm. the you know, the ac pedantic academics who are interested <laughs> in dates. <laughs> like all you of know, those. And so you'll find, <laughs> and he contradicts himself, you know, he'll publish Absolutely. something in a 1945 anthology and he'll say, well, this was done in 1915. And it may have been, but it didn't look like that in 1915. And so, you know, mm -hmm. he's, I, he, I think there's quite a consciously kind of subversive, a subversive um, process there. I think he enjoys, mm -hmm. you know, having a bit of fun at our expense. Yeah, I and certainly, that's your I think I took it to a degree that I never had for this essay um, in kind of asking myself or experimenting with what if we were just to take ARP at his word about himself in a way and let him tell us the stories um, he tells us. And, and then I began to think that there's meaning in that process of storytelling. Um, but when I wrote, I've talked with you about this, Catherine, that when I wrote my dissertation, I experienced a similar frustration about dates um, and not really wanting to, to pin him down. Um, I sort of developed the idea since I was working on cutouts and cutting out and thinking a lot about his subtractive processes that his of as we know it is a subtraction um, from what there might have been since we have Francois Arp telling us and of course this could be apocryphal claims too but that his first what's thought of as his first wood relief uh, from 1914 uh, the Der Hirsch or the, the deer um, which is a large uh, a large kind of stela shaped relief that's in the Pompidou. It was one of several reliefs from that year that became firewood for their apartment in the winter. Um, and then since we have an, a photograph of Arp burning drawings that he wasn't content with, and Wahlberger talked about him not being content as well, um, and there, there is a thread where people talk about his perfectionist streak as well. Um, and so I think he did shape the body of work that we know, and I think that that was a creative act for him. Um, so I, um, and then I think Marguerite became part of that process as they began to date things after the war, um, from what I've learned from Valberga. So, um, so I like to think of it as part of the work. Um, I think many 20th century artists, although I think he's pretty extreme, um, <laughs> participated in shaping their own legacy that way. Um, but uh, yeah, but I did have a moment, not a crisis, but after writing this <laughs> essay, I thought, oh no, like I'm still writing a book on art, but I've just kind of like thrown truth up in the air. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll see what comes from that. But, uh, but it, it was something that resulted from working on him many years and feeling like, you know, there's, you know, there's stories get repeated and most of them don't seem, I don't think he <laughs> sawed through a wall at the age of, Eight, you know, <laughs> something <laughs> tells me that didn't really happen. So, um, yeah, I think it's part of his poetry in a way. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges that we faced is a kind of lack of early photography right. of, of his pieces, mm -hmm. um, either at the foundries or in his own 
you found a photograph of one of the other casts of human concretion in his garden, which was helpful, mm -hmm. but not for our, you know, not for the pieces that we're directly going to treat. Right. Um, and it's sort of typical for historical artists, but to not find any so far is, is mm -hmm. a little unusual. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the foundries often kept fairly incomplete records, if they kept records at all. Mm -hmm. um, so that's also been a challenge we've been working with. Um, but if any of you come across archival photos in your research, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> and Lewis, you, ha you ran into something similar, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm struck by, uh, as you're saying, uh, the sort of textual um, claims you know, for precedence or timing or, or blurring when the timing is. And that seems to come in earlier. And uh, my mind is sort of boggled by thinking of Arp and Elizitsky sitting there in the early 20s, you know, codifying the movements of art. You know, it seems like such a great historical sense of consciousness, but nobody with a camera seems to quite have had that sense of historical consciousness. If you have <laughs> Man Ray, you have to wait till 1933 to get Man Ray photographing, not even entirely, but pretty completely, the fir you know, first surrealist exhibition to be photographed. So I don't know why it is that uh, photography is in kind, of, in kind of delay about that sort of consciousness or sense of documenting. And another not entirely unrelated element of that um, that came out in some of the questions, I think it was a question after Tessa's talk, is Arp, um, Arp having others create his works or create mm. elements of his work. I think that also came up in after discussion of uh, Valberga's paper. Um, that's one of the, another element that Arp, uh, Ha not only had uh, carpenters and artisans cut out the elements for his reliefs and um, had you know, assistance in making his sculptures, but then he would often go back and remake and redo things or refurbish and repaint reliefs or have them refurbished and repainted. And um, that seems very closely, in some ways, very closely related to what he's, what's happened, what you're describing in his poetry and in his writings. Very much so. Certainly, um, the I think he was very open to all sorts of collaborations, be they with other artists, other poets, or indeed with the printers, the you know the people or those who are sawing his wooden pieces. You know, there okay. There are questions to be posed about who then should have their name on the finished work, but. Um, and it's interesting because there is that text in which he alludes to the medieval artists guild as the, the, the instance of a kind of ideal for him of anonymous teams of people working together. Nobody signed their work. It was all done in that spirit of anonymous collaboration. And, you know, if you think of the duo collages with Sophie, not signed, you know, there, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement of that to some extent, the, the value of A, the collaborative undertaking, and B, the notion that the artist should be fairly anonymous and shouldn't assert his or her personality over the existence of the, of the artwork. Mm. Even the duo, the so mm. I will say the so-called duo collages, <laughs> I'm not quite convinced that mm. they are by Hans Ab and Sophie Teuber Ab. They are only signed by Ab. Were okay. they signed? On the back. L okay. On the mm. back. Were they signed mm. later or do we know? Sorry? Were they signed yeah. later or do we know? Do we know when they were signed? A lot of his works have been signed later because right. in the moment when they have been sold, you see mm -hmm. that a signature became important, but even mm -hmm. the real, not all of the reliefs, for example, have been signed in the 20s when mm -hmm. they have been sold. There's correspondence with the Swiss uh, Belgium collector in the 50s. Mm -hmm. And then the collector asked up, would you please sign the relief, sign the relief I have in my collection. It seems to be important now that it has a signature mm -hmm. and maybe a title and something like that. Mm -hmm. 
but even for the textiles, for example, Arp didn't do the textiles by himself. He had women who did that for him, and only in two catalogues in 17 and 18 and 17, um, in right. the, uh, it's said one of his textiles is done by Sophie Teuber Arp, right. executed. And then in the another data catalog, it said that all the ladies' names mm -hmm. are mentioned, but that's the only mm -hmm. time. Never. Mm -hmm. After that, never more. Right, right. Yeah. So it's a little bit, uh, it looks like a kind of conflict to name mm -hmm. all the collaborators. Mm -hmm. In a way, mm -hmm. a foundry is a collaborator as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the. I mean, it's such a curious um, conflict with ARP because you do have, on the one hand, there is this ideal of, of anonymity, and there is a sort of modesty to um, his position and his generosity with so many of his peers. But at the same time, um, I think, as Valberg has said, and as we've seen in other situations. Um, he's very concerned for his place in history and being recognized. I tend to feel like that's one result of how incredibly frustrated he was after World War I not to be able to get to Paris. I mean, it was almost mm -hmm. six or seven years before he could, before he could get there. Um, one of the other things, though, that I'm, I'm thinking about in, in relation to that is just the difficult, kind of the physical difficulties of trying to sort out, if you can, what's what and where the reliefs are concerned. And Emily, one thing I'm curious about is um, SFMOMA has loaned both the sculpture that you discussed and a painted relief to the show. And I think one of the disconnects that happens, and I don't recall how it is at your museum, but a lot of museums take the painted wood reliefs and they're treated by the Department of Painting in conservation uh, and not the Department of Sculpture. And of course, ideally, there would be conversations. But I mean, I'm just wondering how do you, how does uh, your museum or, and other places you've been treat, how would, the, how would that discrepancy be treated? Well, SFMOMA is an interesting conservation lab because we very much try to make our practice mirror the practices of of artists, meaning you know most artists don't just work in one medium, so mm -hmm. it doesn't really make sense so much for conservators to do that as well. So we're much more interdisciplinary than many um, other museum conservation departments. That's mm -hmm. also a feature just of our staff size. Um, right. for, for example, we have one paintings conservator and we have two objects conservators. So for a museum of our size, that's actually pretty small. Mm -hmm. um, so since I was doing the loan review, for the sculpture that came here. I also did the loan review for the wood relief. Um, but I think in the past it's been examined by both objects mm -hmm. and paintings. And um, given that our desks are right next to each other, we mm -hmm. talk quite a bit as well. <laughs> so, um, whereas other institutions you go, they're completely separate enterprises. Right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also by the nature of scale and, and mm -hmm. what the collection is at the core, sometimes they are very different. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But um, we tend to work together a lot. <laughs> and Tessa, have you found, um, what's been your experience working with the reliefs where there can be sometimes um, variations or replicas of existing reliefs or things that seem to have been repainted? Did that impact your research at all? Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, certainly there are those that where there are two, um, but I, again, I kind of developed a coping mechanism <laughs> of not needing <laughs> to pin things down. For, um, and I think for ARP, um, there was that sense of wanting to keep things constantly mobile. So I'm kind of going back and then I'll sort of answer about relief versions. But, um, you know, I think, um, there's a quote, I think it's Hans Richter saying later, but um, you know, the, he talks about the dried herbaria of art history. <laughs> and I think, <laughs> you know, often the procedures of natural history get compared to the work of the art historian. And Zara too talks about like, it is a fact because I've pinned it to my hat like a butterfly. And, you know, I think that for art, 
he would have wanted the works to be more like a butterfly than like a pinned dead butterfly, a living butterfly than a dead <laughs> butterfly. Um, and I think that's why the notion of the apocrypha comes up in the natural history specifically, because I think natural history was uh, an in, a, kind of a, a potent metaphor for pinning things down and dead. Um, and the kind of history that Dada really didn't, and surrealism, really didn't want written. So I, th I do think that Arp wanted to keep these things open-ended, and that relates to going back into his reliefs and um, throwing spanners in the works for the historians um, and refragmenting, you know, taking fragments of poems to make new poems and taking fragments of sculptures to make new sculptures. Um, so in terms of, I can't think of any particular examples or different versions of reliefs. I mean, I really am interested in one example where he, um, a 1923 wood relief called, uh, it was called Head with Green Nose, where he really went in and reshuffled. I had a slide um, in case it came up in my presentation, but um, it's, it's sort of this beautiful turquoise relief owned by the art museum in, in Roland Zeck. And I tried to retrace how he, how he edited it. And what was interesting was that you can see, at least in that case, that he would have, um, because when he went back to cut, he kind of then, it's almost like he put it in a blender, he kind of shuffled it. So it was a really recognizable kind of head shape or in an Arpian head shape. Um, and then it becomes kind of like a comma with like a hook and um, there's a kind of clockwise rotation and elevating to the next tier of pieces that he does. So it was kind of interesting to trace that, but you also see that as he cut in, you know, you then see where there had been paint um, Sorry, so you see blanks, you see uh, raw wood. Um, so you see that he probably constructed and then painted in this case, so he did form and then color. So it's kind of an interesting forensic case too um, that he gives us. And we also see um, you know, the edges that are normally where the paint wraps around, you have edges that become shorn kind of of paint. So I really love that example and I much prefer the altered 1964 version to the 1923 <laughs> original, which is so, um, symmetrical and <laughs> relatively boring. Um, so I guess I always prefer that mobile through the blender arp than, than I do. Um, but there is an interesting difference in patina, you might say, of the early reliefs and the post-war reliefs or post-40s reliefs. I guess that's the same thing. Um, that he really used a rougher brush um, and a, or like a rougher, preferred a rougher finish in the the works that you'll see like on the far wall in the big gallery, so from the 1910s to things you'll see like um, mm -hmm. um, maybe starting with 1930, uh, where he used a cleaner finish and I think he allowed more retouching and he had Marcel Schneider helping him by then. So, um, so you can, and again there I prefer the rougher. So I don't know, we all have our biases, but, <laughs> um, but he certainly shifted his own approach to surface. Uh, as time went on. So that's an interesting question as well. And also that sort of healthy disrespect for the, the sort of sanctity of the original or the definitive and, and um, singular finished work. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was writing my book, there were two things that really stood out. One was um, a letter from the editor of a journal saying, you know, dear Mr. Arp, I'm really sorry that poem is about to go into print, and no, you may not change it. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing was a letter from Peggy Guggenheim, and the reply from Arp. Peggy Guggenheim had written to Arp to say that the that wonderful relief with the upturned shoe, it was starting to look a little bit the worse for wear. And Arp's reply, don't worry, Peggy, I'll be right down there with my paint, box, you know, I'll, 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 I'll fix it up for you. So, you know, he's quite, um, you know, happy to see the work um, mm -hmm. take on new forms and... Um, yeah. I think so. I think so, too. Um, yeah, I'd be, we're quickly running out of time. Um, first thing I want to do, though, is invite the panelists do any of you have questions for each other that we all might be interested in hearing as well? 
I did have a question for Valborga, which she answered privately, and it was about Sophie's um, practice regarding the titles of her works, because it did seem to me that there was one example that she cited, which seemed to stand out, because it was, it seemed to me very uncharacteristic, and it was called Coquille et Fleur, A Shell and Flower, and it, it, from 1938, whereas every other example that you showed us seemed to be a much more, dare I say, perfunctory title, or a title that reflected the forms, the abstract forms. Mm -hmm. And I did wonder whether in this whole discussion of Sophie and ARP and their mutual, their, the crossover of their influences, whether that was an ARP title. Yes. As, as I said, uh, Sophie Teuber ARP didn't, um, most of her works didn't have any title. And uh, it's, the interesting point is, for example, that in 37 there was a famous constructivist uh, exhibition in Basel in the Kunsthalle, and she sent a letter to the director for her works explaining him, as you know, I don't title my works, therefore I will give you a description. And she is giving a very detailed description mm -hmm. to circles and rectangles and colors and everything, so that it's very clear which work is which work, you see. If she is giving titles, for example, this relief you are talking about, Coquille Fleur, it's exhibited in Amsterdam in the abstract um, art exhibition in 38, and it's just relief, you see. And the way of titling or giving just only the technique, this is something Alp did at the very beginning, if you have a look at the catalogue of the Galerie Tanner in 15, mm -hmm. and in the next years when he's talking about a collage, then it said ein Klebebild. Mm -hmm. Klebebild, the German, it's with glued, mm -hmm. it's just paper, it's glued, or Stickerei, or maybe Gestaltung, which is really an, an abstract title. And so she has, um, if she gives titles, in the 30s, for example, it's like Composition, as I said, or the one Café House, which is uh, the painting is from 28, just the time when she made the uh, interior design for the Obed, and in the Obed she designed a café as well, so this is the connection for this painting. And if you have a look at this painting, then you can have an idea of sitting in a café, people in a café, so that's, but Coquille Fleur, that's, that's up, you see. When the catalogue raisonné has been done for Sophie Teuber Arp, it was uh, there was a young guy from he was a painter from Basel. He helped Arp. Arp invited him to come to the house in Meudon and to see all the works. And this guy went to he took measurements, and his kind let's say titles is a first description of what he saw on the paper or what the relief he didn't title. So what it's just let's say, two circles or rectangles or something like that. It's really a description of what was on the work, mm. but no title. Later on up, then up transferred it into a kind of title. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think uh, I'm pretty sure that Coquille Fleur is a Max Ernst title from the pretty frequently used in earlier, in the early, mm -hmm. mid-30s. So maybe it somehow migrated Mm. Yeah. But I, I wanted to ask Wahlberg if, I just don't know, did Sophie write poetry or no. do a fair amount of writing? No, she didn't write poetry, yeah. but it was quite interesting to learn through the letters, through the correspondence. She was a reader from the very beginning. She is reading a lot of books that, for example, for the art magazine Plastic, she edited. Mm -hmm. There is, uh, uh, starting in the third issue, um, a roman, how do you say it? Uh, yeah, a novel. A novel, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, this is her idea. At the very mm -hmm. first moment, I thought it must be Alp, because it's his, it's a surrealistic novel, you see. Mm -hmm. And there is one of the, um, of one of the guys is complaining that Alp is getting more and more influence on uh, uh, plastic. Mm -hmm. But it's really her idea. This is telling her sister that she has the idea about this novel and how it should work and who she likes to invite. Mm -hmm. So she was very interested in that. And mm -hmm. she is one of the first, let's say, when they met and when they are becoming a couple in the letters from 1919, a, a critic of his uh, poems. 
and mm. up was uh, aware of he was listening of what she was saying so but she herself didn't write any parts um, I think how are we doing on time Anna close close to time I have a question okay. for you. do we have time what, what is your okay. I have a question for Lewis okay well. um, thinking about this group of political works that ARP did for the 37 mm -hmm. show or 38 37 um, 38. Started to be um, planned in the winter of 37. Yeah. I guess I was wondering through the course of your talk if you think exhibition um, allowed ARP to do things that were more of like a one-off or things that really didn't fit. So the opportunity of an exhibition allowed him, it seemed as I was watching, it allowed him to do things that really didn't fit with that kind of of that we've talked mm -hmm. about him constructing or he's an artist who repeats himself a lot. So it's really interesting that in 38, he does this weird paper mache with a really strangely political title where you can read the news and um, and this cage with the clouds or the mm -hmm. cotton. And I was just kind of wondering if you think exhibition, you know, when planning for an exhibition that created new opportunities for Yeah, I think your, your implication is right. In this case, it was, there was such a build up to that moment making a big effort uh, certainly, it's weird for him to decorate a mannequin. I don't think that would have his, mm -hmm. <laughs> been his choice. That was the group project. And there was a fair amount. Of, there are accounts of uh, the Surrealist meeting in cafes and such and throwing out ideas and planning, uh, you know, talking a lot about what was going to be, you know, at, at Wildenstein. It was such a visible right bank venue, which they, I think, both wanted to kind of desacralize and also, you know, make their own statement. Um, I think Mutilea Apatrite is a little bit earlier, but the cage piece and the whole dialogue with Unye um, is really picking up there. And I think that exhibition making was a moment for him to interact more with Unye, who actually uh, was, was talking with Valberga about the Paris Gallery Beaux Arts exhibition kind of traveled in altered form to Amsterdam, and you showed mm -hmm. some of the views at the Gallery Robert, where actually in some of them the uh, the art sculptures are placed in different view in different spots in different uh, photographs. So I don't know how if we can be sure that how documentary those photographs are, but that <laughs> Breton had gone off to Mexico, and that whole venture in. Amsterdam was directed by Unye, and Arp has quite a, and, and Sophie Tauber are also have quite a presence and representation in the Amsterdam show, which is lesser known. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there's, the exhibition put them in greater dialogue and collaboration mm -hmm. at that moment. Yeah, and the cage part of, I mean, I think that whole object is, is very Hugnier-like, actually, mm -hmm. it's not very, typical of art, but Hugnier did a fair bit of woodworking and, mm -hmm. and uh, ran this bookbinding atelier, so he brought a certain uh, kind of techniques to, to that, and that's, yeah, I, I, I find there's quite a bit of his hand maybe in that, in the prisoner, in the idea of that mm -hmm. piece, which is not preserved, so we've kind of lost uh, uh, our focus on it, but uh, think it's worth mm -hmm. thinking about. All right. Um, I think we'll, we'll unfortunately bring this to an end. We could go on much longer. The only thing that um, I will throw out, just because I think we promised to answer it during the panel, is that somebody had a question about posthumous casts. Uh, you'll see a few posthumous casts in the exhibition. Uh, ARP didn't start casting in any to any great degree until after World War II and at his death a number of the additions were not yet completed. There was uh, his widow uh, Marguerite Hagenbach Arp uh, completed, prepared and completed a casting list and so those are authorized casts that um, followed, uh, that followed from, uh, from that list. Um, one of the things that's been complicated that complicates our discussions of all these issues is that there was some years ago um, 
a problem with unauthenticated um, casts or stone versions of sculptures being created. Um, I think that's, from everything I can tell, that's very much been kind of weeded out and separated, um, but it definitely sort of confused and already um, interesting and complex situation with ARPS, uh, with ARPS work in many media. So I hope we can continue this conversation upstairs. Thank you very much for coming this morning and afternoon.